Welcome to the fourth episode of the second season of the Pig X podcast. I'm your host, Delaney Howell. On this month's episode, we're talking about porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, also known as PERS, with Dr. Paul Yeski and Associate Professor Daniel Linares. Let's hear a little bit more about each of our guests' backgrounds before we dive into the topic of PERS. Dr. Yeski, let's start with you and your background at the Swine Vet Center. I practice here in St. Peter, Minnesota with 16 total veterinarians and all we do is swine. And unfortunately, uh, we've had the opportunity to see a lot of the 1441C variant circulating within our practice area and had a little more experience with it than we'd necessarily like to have and have worked with PERS and other swine diseases over the years. So a lot of experience, unfortunately, dealing with PERS. Now, as I mentioned, our second guest today is Daniel Linares. Here at the university side, I am an associate professor here working with graduate students, dealing with several different strategies on detection, control, monitoring, elimination of, of, uh, of PERS virus. And one of those projects is actually led by Dr. Giovanni Trevisan, a postdoc here working with us where we consolidate data from different veterinary diagnostic laboratories here in the U.S., including Iowa State, Minnesota, Kansas, and South Dakota. And we take a look at this data at least once a week and report once a month. One of the things we've, we've seen is a spike in, in this particular virus a strain that we're talking about. And every time we see a spike in something like that, we would li- we like to pick pick up the brains of our advisory board, like which are individuals like Dr. Yeski that are actually with the boots on the ground and dealing with the virus and see what he's see, seeing and hearing and, and how he's uh, dealing with, with this situation. Now, as we dive into our conversation about PERS, we've got to do a quick recap here because as you may or may not be aware of, PERS is a viral disease that impacts hogs of any age and any sex, but it's one of the most costly to the U.S. pork industry and accounts for about $650 million in losses annually. But there are more details we can learn about the disease as it continues to change and adapt. Whereas, as we all know, it's a virus that it's pretty variable over time and space, so it keeps changing on us. And right now, talking about this specific virus strain, there is no unique terminology that describes what we're talking about. So the, the molecular virologists have actually combined two classifications for this virus, which is RFLP, the restriction fragment polymorphism. It's RFLP144 of the lineage 1C. And one step ahead is not just any 1C, it's the 1C variant. So altogether, we have first 144 of lineage 1C variant strain. It may sound a little bit complex, but again, it's just a combination of two nomenclatures that together uh, specify this unique virus that we're, we're talking about. Okay, that may have been a little confusing, so let's just do a quick recap. As Daniel mentioned there, this new variant that we're talking about here specifically in this episode today can be classified as the PERS-144 of the lineage 1C variant strain, which essentially is just talking about this particular strain of the current PERS virus. We've seen over the course of my practice, experience. We've seen these new viruses come in periodically. And typically what we've seen with these viruses, they come in, they come in and they're very, they're, they're more severe as they first start to circulate within the populations. And then they tend to be less severe over time and usually back off fairly quickly and are still, still clinically relevant, not as severe as they were when they first were identified. And Uh, This virus really isn't, I don't think, acting different than some of the previous viruses we've seen in the past. It just happens to be the new one. And I'd say there's a couple unique things with this virus that I, I, in my career I haven't seen is the number of mummies that this one produces seems to be higher than the other viruses we've seen in the past. And in the past, I don't remember 
the lateral breaks in nursery as much. And we had more of those with this particular strain. I think it may just be due to the numbers that are out there, but we saw more of that lateral infection of nursery sites, which historically I'd say we wouldn't see as much. We'd see more of that in the grow finish, but it's really not different than some of the previous viruses we've dealt with. It just happens to be the one we're dealing with now. And the break may not be as, say, dramatic in the finishers as as it is in south farms or early nursery. So it's it's not hard to go unnoticed, right? Or almost subclinical. Yeah. It's still there. It's still causing damage. But if you don't measure, you don't find that you're leaving money on the table. So some of the implications include, especially in those production systems or those practices where people need to visit multiple barns. Goes back to what Paul was talking about, the biocontainment and and people, pigs, uh, supplies, kind of movement between the farms. Keep that in mind as we go uh, forward. Today, we're dealing with this virus. Tomorrow, the virus is just going to change the name, like Paul said, right? A few years ago, it was 174, and now it's this particular strain of 144 of lineage 1C. And so who knows tomorrow if the history keeps repeating itself. And I don't see the reason why it's not going to. It's those things that's going to emerge. And so we've got to be ready with our monitoring systems, with our biosecurity, biocontainment, and communication right between uh, within and between systems. As Daniel just mentioned there, we have started to see an uptick in PERS cases, which will go through the history of that here in just a moment. But it's important to keep in mind, PERS are a very impactful disease, especially heading into the fall season when we could see yet again another new wave hit. Well, the the uptick is, was actually happening in uh, different waves. The first wave was say sometime in October, end of the October of last year of 2020. And then that was more in the grow finish side of the of the story. There were certainly some south farms infected too. But then things calmed down and what when was that Paul? Around uh, May, April, May of 2021, there was the second wave with more more farms affected. And now we're towards the end of that second wave the peak of the summertime, which is not surprising, right? Usually this time of the year, things are, I, I don't want to say quiet for Perth, but relatively quiet relative to spring and fall. And now gotta we, we'll keep, keep watching as we are approaching the end of the summer, beginning of the fall in a few months now. I would agree that we saw the similar pattern as what you saw in the diagnostic data One of the first herds we had was back in May. We thought maybe that one was the first one we'd seen and was a more severe break. And as we watched that one through, then we saw uh, more of the cases again in that late October and mid-November timeframe was kind of that first wave Daniel talked about. And then that second wave starting uh, that kind of end of April and through the month of May, which is unusual. We usually see a small spike in the spring, but this was a big spike. And so definitely different. When researchers went back and looked, they found it as far back as uh, similar isolates as far back as February. So uh, the virus has been out there circulating for a while, but really showed up and would agree with Daniel kind of sitting back anxiously waiting to see what's going to happen this fall, a little fall, a little concerned that we may see more activity again here as we get into that October, November timeframe when we seasonally tend to see more PERS occurring in the in the industry. Back to the lineages, I think one thing that's unique, at least with us, as we looked at our data set, are, are our farms that were involved with this particular virus. Typically, when we're seeing new viruses come up and we do the DNA sequencing or the RNA sequencing, and we're looking at the percent homology with viruses, we rarely see much homology. But this particular virus, we've seen many, many viruses that would be within that 2% range and some a number of viruses that are 100% matches and a number that are very close matches. And so I'd say that's a little bit unique to this virus at this point in time too, that just the number of relatively close matches when we look at the OR5 sequencing which suggests how well transmissible this particular virus is, right, Apple, relative to the other viruses. Yeah, certainly um, 
certainly seems to be dominating the virus activity out there here, especially this spring. As we classify the recent waves of PERS, we start to identify future waves. We previously discussed that this fall could have the potential to be a time to see a surge in PERS cases. So there are some characteristics we can identify to help explain the seasonality of the disease as well. We've been working with PERS for a long time. Certainly we think there's some impact as we come into harvest and we have you know, the manure hauling going on, the changes in the weather pattern, potentially some more stresses and the weather conditions become more more allowable to allow the virus to survive longer periods of time is some of the some of the conjectures out there as to why we see the why we see the more seasonal trend and so the weather conditions are right to allow it to spread easier and so that's a, a part of why why we have more concern as we go into the into the fall fall months here where we typically see it when we look at the Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Project data, it shows us that the period is very repeatable in that end of October, mid-November timeframe, going back to 2009, where they've been tracking uh, herds for that number of years and seeing it show up very repeatably in that period of time as far as uh, when they would classify a new epidemic, so to speak, of the of the virus. And so using their terminology, so... We know that the season's been there and it's very repeatable over time. And we do see that little spike up in May many times, but this year the magnitude was much higher and typically wouldn't expect to see that. And then as the summertime, like we said before too, is that uh, the summertime, the environmental conditions, the virus probably doesn't survive as well. And uh, every summer we tend to see the cases go down, not totally go away, but uh, certainly go down. I think it's just harder for the virus to move within areas. The impact that PERS has on production ranges from animal welfare to economics and everything in between. These new waves bring forth challenges that may be more intense than what we've seen in the past. From a production standpoint, we can see a deeper impact on operations already. This particular virus, I would say, has had a fairly consistent pattern of what we've seen. I think the first wave last fall was certainly clinically the most severe, and it really just showed us everything that PERS can do. Prominently, what we saw with this one was higher sow mortality, higher number of abortions, an increased number of stillborns, an increased number of mummies, an increased pre-weaning mortality, all those things happening at the sow farm at a higher magnitude probably than we'd seen for a while. And certainly some herds very high numbers. And as we saw those pigs transfer out to the nursery and grow finish, we saw an increased mortality in the nursery and also the finishers. And again, some higher numbers than what we've typically seen from other purse strains. And so that's why this one's gotten a little more conversation. As it came to the spring months, we saw that there was still the still all the clinical signs you'd expect to see with PERS. The mortality and the abortion numbers seem to be a little lower and more what we'd typically expect for an outbreak of really any PERS strain. Farrowing house, the number of mummies and the pre-weaning mortality certainly continued to be higher with farms weaning, essentially zero weaning for a number of weeks. And so we had also the continued nursery more of the nursery mortality as we have had these farms put the pigs out into the nurseries now, so the higher mortality rate. And we also saw higher nursery and finishing mortality in what we would consider lateral breaks, pigs that were placed from negative farms that broke in the area due to area spread. And so we saw some of those numbers that were more surprisingly high than what we'd seen in the past. As we've been talking about the new variant that has been circulating, we need to also understand the differences between the branches and types of PERS because it's a virus. So PERS is obviously able to replicate and change over time, which is what we've currently been seeing. So let's dive into some of the differences in variants. This trend is just like Paul said before, it's just like the virus keeps changing a little bit over time. Right. And this, and this particular virus is just one unique strain belonging to that branch of 144s. 144, the fa- that family of virus has been around for, for a long, long, long time. Recently, it 
they just had a few mutations in the in the whole genome that was associated with this perhaps escaping immune response and and so associated with circulation in the pig and replication in the pig at, at uh, very high loads right that was something that we saw in the in the diagnostic reports here was evidence of of higher high loads in the in the tissues being submitted right uh, represented the, as uh, those with the low ct values in the pcr so this virus with the ex, ex, uh, extremely efficient kind of uh, re replication and so lots of virus in the coming out of the pigs and a lot of virus in the environment and if you think about it it's just a lot of opportunities for the virus to to keep transmitting between and within herds yeah, it probably makes sense why we saw the area activity and why we saw a little bit more clinical signs just because of the viral loads in the pigs. Yeah, and the previous kind of looking at our, our database here where we have production losses from, from a number of herds. If you think about an average, an average loss in number of piglets after a PERS outbreak is somewhere around 2,600 to 3,000 pigs not weaned. Per, th per thousand sows in the, in the herd throughout the course of the outbreak. And like Paul said, if you, if you m make those math of a herd not winning any pig for a number of weeks, that's just way, way, way be above the kind of what you expect from a typical purse break, right? Now, because this new strain is so aggressive, it's also important we talk a little bit here about biosecurity, because of course that's also top of mind for producers. But don't worry, there are a few things we can do to mitigate and control some of these outbreaks. Yeah, we've really managed these outbreaks like we have other PERS viruses in the past. We work to try and get the herds back on track as relatively quickly as possible. We use the, the herd closure technique where we fill the herd up with the number of females that we can, which we load the herd up so we've got a peer, so we can go ahead and close the herd. And then we go ahead and close the herd for typically 210 to 240 days. And then we go ahead and homogenize the herd and do direct virus exposure to the herd so that all the animals are exposed, we can start the clock ticking and then we work at trying to eliminate that field virus from the herd. And so we've handled this one very similar to what we have with other viruses in the past. And some of the early outbreaks have responded similar to what we'd expect. And within the time frames we would expect to be getting the piglets testing negative on processing fluids then on due to wean samples. And so we've seen it moving along the normal patterns that we'd expect. There's always variation from farm to farm, but it looks like it's not going to be different than how we've managed other other herds. On the grow finish side, we've used, you know, if we get a positive site, we've used where we'll depop, clean up and disinfect the site and, and reload it, hopefully with negative pigs and also vaccinating the finishers. Some some sow herds have chosen to use filtration to help control some of the spread. Others have used vaccination or a combination of the vaccination and filtration. And in the grow finish side, use the vaccination to help have at least some immunity available. In general, the higher, the, the more severe the production loss is, the, the quicker the herd takes to, to recover, to start producing negative pigs again. Right. So, and the other, and, and vice versa. If you have a break that has low production cost and production impact in general, those take more time. It takes more time for the virus to circulate. And so it takes more time for the herd to, to get uh, rid of the virus. And I was just going to ask Paul if, uh, based on what he, he, he saw so far from the herds that broke last year and herds that broke now, does he think that those herds are achieving stability? In other words, producing consistently negative pigs sooner, later, and in average compared to other viruses? Yeah, I would say what we've seen that time to stability has been consistent with what we saw with other viruses. There has been some variation between herds, but certainly not necessarily going longer. It takes a little bit longer for the processing fluids, I would say, with this one to go negative. Seems like 
it hangs out there a little bit longer in the processing fluids. But once you get to, and it does depend a little bit on the immune status. We had some herds that were previously exposed, some that were vaccinated, and it does appear that those herds are, at least some of the ones that were previously exposed have come come around very quickly. And the virus did move through these populations very rapidly. When we did the direct virus exposure, we really didn't see much happening. I think most of the transmission had occurred prior to, had occurred through the herd on its own, pretty much. Well, yeah, less bad, right? Because the last thing we want is a virus that produces a significant production impact and that persists a long time in the population. Yeah, absolutely. Good news that they're progressing towards producing negative pigs again. It's still taking a while. The spring ones are are just starting to stabilize and back into production. So it'll be a little bit before we know how they're going to respond. But so far, it appears that they're coming back like we'd expect. When it comes to the people aspect, we as producers can do lots of things to help monitor and detect outbreaks. And luckily, there are a variety of methods that we can use to do so. So let's talk a little bit more about some of those options that we have. Farms will do a number of different methods of detection. The processing fluids have become very popular because they're a relatively easy sample to get and relatively inexpensive to run because of the fact that we can pool those samples and still have good detectability. And so that's been a popular means of testing on the south farm side, still doing due to wean piglets. Blood samples from the due to wean piglets has been effective and still used a lot in the industry. I would say this spring we did pick up a couple of farms on routine monitoring uh, before they went clinical. And at least we're able to know that the farm was going clinical before it went. And so it's like the other viruses, uh, you, you can, if you're doing a routine sampling protocol, you can pick some of these up before they're actually to the clinical phase. And the, the other options are the oral fluids in the wean nursery, in the due to wean pigs, in the nursery pigs, in the grow finish. And certainly the nursery grow finish become really the way we monitor those. and has been a good tool if we're wanting to look at areas, area involvement and status of herds and those sort of things once once it starts to move move within an area. One thing that might be worth talking about is some of the, there are some new technologies that are available today. There are some differential PCRs because most of the pigs are vaccinated in the finisher that can be used to say whether the vaccine is there or so if you run the PCR and they're positive and you run the vaccine and find that the vaccine's positive, you can see, you can determine if there's a field strain there or help you to try and determine if there's a field strain there. If you really want to know, the best way is to use the the clamp technology for the specific vaccine you're using and doing the sequencing. That way it can just look for the field strains. And hopefully have I, I've explained that right, uh, Daniel. Yeah, a couple of different options. Either use a vaccine-specific uh, PCR, right, for whatever commercial vaccine people are using, or, like you said, sequence the virus or use a, a, a clamp against a particular vaccine that you want to increase the chance of finding a wild-type virus in there. Anyways, another good kind of point that we like to put on the table is for this virus, virus as well as any others, it's the importance of sampling repeatedly over time and space, right? Whether that space is your farrowing, farrowing crates or rooms or barns or down in the finisher. What I want to say is that don't quickly extrapolate results from a few samples that you collected this week to the next week or to the next room. Sample repeatedly over time and across uh, the different air spaces that you have. Even if you have to pull, it's okay to pull, especially with this virus that there's a lot in the environment compared to other ones, not the environment, but in general in the, in the peak population. So it's, it's okay to, to pull processing fluids. Like Paul, Paul Yeski just said, uh, one processing f- fluid for the whole week may be a good start. If you do oral fluids, again, just try to make uh, uh, as many as you can to represent as many rooms and weeks over time, even if you have to pull them one one in one in five, ten, all the way to twenty to twenty. Better having 
more representation of the pigs over over time in rooms than just a few sample a small sample size and then extrapolating that sample size to to the rest of the population producers have a lot of things they can do to be biosecure to keep PERS from coming into their operation. So as we dive further into biosecurity, we'll have to look into bioexclusivity and biocontainment as well. When we talk about the bioexclusion, which that's what most people focus on in biosecurity and is probably the most important thing we want to keep it out. I'm not sure that anything's different than we do for the other viruses. The biggest challenge with this particular virus and the number of viruses that are out in the environment is that I think it challenges every step of our biosecurity plan to the to the next level, so to speak, just because of the viral numbers and viral load. And so I think going back in some of our outbreak investigations that we've worked on would suggest that Things aren't always done the way you think they are, and so it doesn't hurt to go back and reevaluate your procedures and make sure they're happening the way you think they are. Every time it seems like we go back and look, there's always a little bit of change, so that's probably a little bit of human nature, but one of those things that we can do. And I think as far as what we can do from a biocontainment side, that's kind of the forgotten part of biosecurity. When we talk about biosecurity, we're usually talking about bioexclusion, not biocontainment. And biocontainment is if we have positive animals, how do we keep from taking that virus off, off of our site to other sites or into the area? And looking at how you're handling mortalities, whether that's composting, whether that's rendering, and also personnel vehicles, thinking about the viral loads we're seeing, you know, are are the are the people doing everything they can to avoid carrying the virus off the farm and that includes people coming to help with repairs and emergency situations and so just making sure we have those proper communications that need to make sure we're doing the best job that we can and realizing it's it is a challenge but i think the industry just has spent more time focused on the bio exclusion versus the biocontainment and just an important thing to remember and Paul, just to follow up on that, we looking at the VDL data, the diagnostic lab data, we saw clearly here that uptick in the PERS activity happened first in Grove Finish, then in South Farms. So would you, would you agree with the statement that uh, biosecurity slash biocontainment in Grove Finish, that's something that the swine industry, that's almost say like a low hanging fruit or a call for action, something that's the swine industry can needs to improve in, in that area, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's lots of areas for improvement there. And probably one of those things, or it is one of those things we need to be talking about more with producers to make sure that everyone does their part. Well, we're getting to that point in the episode where we like to talk about a few take-home messages, but let's pause here because we just had quite a few take-home messages from both Dr. Yeski and Daniel just now. One of the ones that you'll catch there that Daniel just mentioned right at the end is a low-hanging fruit, which is to identify biosecurity slash biocontainment practices we can do in the grow-to-finish production phase first. But there are just a few other take-home messages that Dr. Yeski is going to share with us before we wrap up for today. You know, as we go into the fall season, I think it's always important to make sure that we're not adding any additional stresses. I think that always helps any disease to move more, making sure we're getting the ventilation adjustments done properly, that we're not adding that additional stress component. And then, as we said before, going back and reviewing some of those biosecurity procedures with everyone just to make sure we're doing what we intend to be doing as we head into the fall time frame. So as we head into the fall months here, it's important to make sure we're doing our part to help mitigate the spread of PERS as much as possible. Because we've talked about them early and We've talked about a variety of things in order to help with biosecurity and mitigate the spread of the virus. We can help control an outbreak before it happens. Today's episode was the first episode touching specifically on PERS, but we've had many other fantastic past episodes talking about biosecurity, ventilation, the list goes on and on. So if you've missed any of the past episodes of the PigX podcast, feel free to check them out wherever you get your podcasts. 
Until next time, I'm your host, Delaney Howell, and this has been the Pig X Podcast. Pig X is a national podcast hosted by the Pig Livability Project partners at Iowa State University, Kansas State University, and Purdue, and supported by the Iowa Pork Industry Center. For more information on the project, head to www.piglivability.org or to inquire directly with questions regarding the project, email ipic at iastate.edu. Pig X, ideas in the swine industry worth sharing.